Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students, welcome back to the lecture series on women's writing. This is lecture number 14 and we are going to talk about desire. When you hear the word desire, what comes into your mind? Is it something that you desire for? Have you thought of what the word signifies? What are the levels of desiring? Can you desire for something which is forbidden by the society? All of these things we are going to cover in this particular lecture. And let me tell you, this is the only lecture in this entire series where we are going to discuss a text para by para. This is very essential because while we are learning about women's writing, we must also learn how to read the writing. Reading the writing letter by letter is fine enough. But it requires training to read between the lines. When I say between the lines, that does not mean that there is something written between two lines. No, there is some underlying meaning. There is something called as hint. There is something called as suggestion. You suggest something which you cannot say directly. So those things we are going to learn and study in this lecture. Let us move forward. As you can see, I have added another word called as discourse. We have discussed discourse in the beginning lectures. You can refer to them. Discourse is when you are bringing something into discussion. Sometimes you have something on your mind which you desire for, but you cannot talk about it. You cannot say it to a friend or you cannot talk about to about it to your mother, your father, your class teacher. You cannot discuss it with anybody because you think that it will not be granted. You think that it is not socially sanctioned. You think you have hit a level beyond which you cannot express. So there are many ways in which you may not talk about desire. That is expression. It is this is not sanctioned by the society. When your desire has something to do with that, you cannot express, you cannot speak about it, you cannot talk about it, you cannot write about it, you cannot frame it in language. You cannot do that. Why? Because you think that there is something bad about it. It is not ethical. It is not the way society ex expects us to behave. So we are trying to bring all of those things into the discussion. Discussion, where is the discussion? I am talking alone and you are listening. But you will go somewhere and you will discuss it with your friends while you are discussing the text while you are talking to your other uh, peers, you will say that, okay, I have seen this lecture today and do you know they speak about, uh, the instructor was talking about discourse, that we need to bring the ideas in our head into discussion. We need to formulate a vocabulary. Formulate a vocabulary. Is there a lack of words? No, there is certainly no lack of words. But exactly the words which will express your desire may not be there. May not be, you may not have heard those words in that particular order which will be able to express your desire. So, we need to start bringing our thoughts into discussion. And same applies for women's writing. Women's writing is everywhere about expression. Bringing the words into the play, bringing the words into the game, so that people will read the words and they will pick up the idea that is in your head unless and until that time you are not going to make any difference. 
but once you start discussing once you bring those ideas into the discussion you are actually creating a discourse you will be the person who is going to create the discourse in which other people will participate and thereby these ideas will expand they will formulate the vocabulary by themselves all right so let us move on to the next slide what is desire i'll give you 5 seconds to think about it think it in your head right at this moment you are supposed to stop and have a look at the slide that is in front of you to long or hope for this is what they have given the definition of desire in merriam webster dictionary and there is another big definition of desire here but apart from these definitions we are going to discuss them in a moment isn't it obvious that you are focusing on this part why are you focusing on this part one is that it is written point wise of course but you are also trying to justify your desire by looking at this is my desire listed in this is my desire whatever is in my head listed in any of the things action situation people you are thinking of that right now so once you start thinking of that you are actually accessing your memories your thought patterns your brain is active and it is trying to justify what it desires for in case you are a student who has just uh, passed 12th class you are desiring to um, get an admission into a very good university or you are desiring to get a good job to make your family condition stable or you are desiring to buy a car or a bike or you are actually uh, planning to take a vacation year a gap year where you are going to travel the world around you all of these things in your head comes in mind uh, comes into the play at once and then you see okay car bike yes that fits the pattern of things actions yes i'm going to take a gap year i'm going to travel yes it fits situations yes i'm going to improve the family situation i'm going to improve my situation maybe i am in a relationship which i want maybe i'm in a relationship which i don't want so i'm going to improve my situations and people i desire someone i desire a loved one generally in heterosexual relationships a male desires a female and a female desires a male this kind of situations apart from these apart from these situations maybe somebody desires to see a person a long lost friend you have never met that friend after maybe uh, preschool or the nursery years and you want to see that friend but you are never able to see that friend and your brain is avoiding it because it is giving you trouble it is giving you a sort of a uh, bad feeling inside you because your desires are frustrated this is what we say when we want something and we don't get it that is the situation of being frustrated and that results to what you popularly call as frustration i am very frustrated i am i have frustration that is what you say so the idea of this thing is directly linked with this thing when you desire something and you don't get it it results into frustration what is the opposite situation when you desire something and you get it then what happens is that a part of your brain feels a kind of pleasure it becomes happy you must go or you may go and look up pleasure principle by sigmund freud pleasure principle sigmund freud it is a kind of psychoanalytical theory 
and this person over here, this Austrian uh, philosopher and doctor, of course, is a doctor first. He talked about all of these things, especially the pre pleasure principle and how the body reacts, how the mind reacts to our desire. So the entire psychoanalytical realm has a very big discourse on desire because it is directly related to the scientific field. It is direct, directly related to the medical field. We think that when it goes to the medical field or scientific field, talking about desire is okay. That is why you feel more comfortable talking about your desire to a therapist. A therapist is a person who gives you professional therapy who gives you professional therapy and if you are feeling sad or down or depressed, that person is going to help you. What happens when somebody like a therapist is not around you? Would you talk about your desire with your friends? No, that becomes a problem. You do not discuss about your uh, personal feelings or desires with your friends. We do not discuss our desire with our family members even. What happens to us then? Then we feel the frustration burdening our mind. Then we feel that uh, pressure on our mind which drives us crazy. What happens to women in our society? Women, they want education, they want freedom on equal terms with men. That is the simplest thing there is. But women are not given that kind of opportunity. They are asked to perform certain duties in the entire game of social reality because of the only obvious thing that women's body is capable of child bearing. Therefore, the duties become separate, the responsibilities become separate and the expectation of the society becomes separate from a woman. What happens then? Does the woman not have desire? Does she not have desire? Does she not have a desire to buy a car, a desire to go on a holiday trip, a desire to make a situation better or worse, a desire to have other people around her? So that should be brought to discussion and women's writing mostly covers this area. This is the crux of women's writing. They talk about the desire, they talk about the frustration, they talk about the pleasure of women and let me tell you, the society is not built, the patriarchal society is not built in that way. The society rather expects women to keep shut about their desires. No, you cannot have a desire. No, you cannot have your own pleasure. You cannot have your own frustrations. Everything should revolve around the family structure. That is what the mentality of society is. Okay, now let us come to this. The first one, to long or hope for. You long for a person. You want a person. You want a thing. I longed for a radio. When I was, uh, you know, when I was in class 8, I told my father that, father, I call him papa, so papa, can you please give me a radio? My father did not give it to me in class 8, but when I uh, passed class 10, my father gifted me my first radio, that is a Philips FM radio, and I used to hear that, uh, radio, hear to it, uh, I listen to it, not hear. Uh, I used to listen to the radio from morning till afternoon and then some gap maybe uh, in the afternoon after that from evening till morning again. The whole night I used to listen to the radio and study and do my work and everything but the radio used to be on all the time. So that was a pleasure that I derived when my desire was fulfilled. That is only a small thing. And thinking of a small thing to be a part of your life is not wrong. Nobody can tell you that it is wrong. Conscious impulse 
you can just go and have a look at the uh, MWD towards something that promises enjoyment or satisfaction in its attainment. When you attain that thing, when you get that thing, when you obtain that thing, you feel satisfied, you feel peace, you feel pleasure. All these feelings are very personal. It does not have anything to do with the family. It does not have anything to do with the society. It is your personal, it, is my, it was my personal feeling. My entire family was unhappy because I was playing radio songs all the time. But it was my personal satisfaction that I wanted. Of course, after some time they you know, just asked me to uh, switch it off most of the time. So I used to listen to it, but the volume was very, very low. So I found my own ways. I hope you can also find your desire and get it fulfilled within the functions of the society. Going out of the society and fulfilling your desire, that is something which creates a problem. Because when you are out of a system, you are not really, let me give you a diagrammatic representation. This is the system that you are in. And somebody who is standing outside the system is not really opposing the system. Because if you need to oppose the system, you need to oppose it from the inside. From the outside, you are just an exception. See, that is the difference. Okay? All right. So, things, actions, situations, people, these are all the things that we desire for and more, of course. Desiring a person. Now, here comes the idea of sexuality. How do you desire a person? Why do you desire a person? Best discussion or discourse rather was given by this particular American philosopher called Judith Butler. She wrote a book, Gender Trouble, Feminism and Subversion of Identity. When she wrote the book, I think it was published somewhere around 2000, a very recent book and it talks about many things, many things related to the sexuality of human beings. And it takes a lot from the writer called Michel Foucault. Because this, per this person wrote the first history of sexuality. He was the first person to bring sexuality in discourse, into the discussion. Before that, nobody even cared. Because everybody thought that it is, uh, you know, given by God and a person should behave in a, one, in a particular way and the person, a male should always desire a female, a female should always desire a male. And beyond that, there is nothing. But Foucault, for the first time, brought into discourse the history of sexuality of human beings. And now we have Judith Butler. She mostly talks about the queer community. Queer community is the community of the homosexuals, the transsexuals, the bisexuals, those who are not heterosexuals. Heterosexuals that is attracted towards the opposite sex, not heterosexuals. They are something outside that relationship. They think of it as uh, the, they think of the heterosexuals as, okay, you are fine, you are a part of the majority of course, but we are also there, all right. So, the first chapter of the book of Judith Butler, she talks about subjects of sex, gender and desire. So, she makes a distinction between sex and gender, these two are different things. She also makes a point that sex and gender has not been understood properly and she also philosophizes it. So, you can go and have a read of the book, you will understand that completely. But what is interesting over here is the word desire. She speaks about desire. 
and desire over here is treated in this way homosexuality where a uh, male desires a male where a female desires a female and heterosexuality when the opposite sexes desire each other but she gives another theory based on the psychoanalytical structures and readings of the uh, medical uh, of the doctor called Sigmund Freud she quotes Sigmund Freud in many places and comes up with the idea that all the human beings have homosexual feelings at their ch uh, childhood everybody has homosexual feelings that is it is not the Oedipus complex or the Electra complex Oedipus complex is that the male child is attracted towards the mother and the female child is attracted towards the father this notion was trashed by her she said that no every child is equally attracted towards the parent that is if it is a boy it is equally attracted towards his father as towards his mother if it is a girl she is equally attracted towards the father and towards the mother but here comes the fun part the society says no you cannot be attracted to the same sex you cannot be attracted to the same sex so right from the childhood the girls attractions towards the mother is cut off and the baby boys attraction towards the father is cut off now the only thing that remains between these two is what we view or rather the entire people the philosophers the medical people everybody think of it as the Oedipus complex for this relationship and Electra complex for this relationship Electra complex is just hold on a second yeah Electra complex is for this relationship that is the girl is attracted towards the father Oedipus complex is the boy is attracted towards the mother so what happens when we have some kind of desire in our mind but we cannot fulfill it we just talked about it a few uh, minutes ago we said that when you have a desire and it cannot be fulfilled what happens is frustration how can a child feel frustrated yes the child feels frustrated but it is not capable of showing it in his behavior or her behavior what happens is the repression of emotion whatever emotion that child has it gets suppressed inside the deep of the mind you know the in the bottom of the mind it gets suppressed and repressed everybody pressurizes that feeling and traps it into a small box and you know just throws it into the depth of the ocean of the mind lost forever but does that mean it is not there of course it is there and that gives the idea of frustration in a child and apart from that frustration in a child after that what happens is something called melancholia this is both Freud and Butler both of them agree on this point that we develop a kind of melancholia in our persona we develop that it becomes a personality trait in us melancholia means sadness what gives human beings the sadness inside them is the suppression of the childhood emotions you had a, a kind of relationship you wanted a person in your childhood but you did not get that person 
because you were too small and you never knew the vocabulary to express your emotions and it got repressed under the societal pressure and you developed a kind of sadness in yourself. That sadness adds to your personality. When you grow up and you see same sex people having relationship, you become angry. Why do you become angry? Because you have suppressed that desire in your head, right in your childhood. You are told that this is wrong. You have suppressed that desire. Now that desire is hitting on you because now it is the time you are seeing it in front of your eyes that a person, a couple is having a same sex relationship, homosexual relationship. You become angry. That is the source of wrath for most of the people. That is the hatred that is among the majority for the homosexual people because they have attained a kind of freedom which we couldn't. This is a story by the New Zealand writer Catherine Mansfield. It is called Bliss. Bliss can also be an, um, synonymous to satisfaction, can be synonymous to pleasure. All of these things are very much can be synonymous to peace, very much related to bliss. But bliss is this and more because it is a different word, it has synonyms. But the state of bliss is where you have everything you want. You wanted a car, you had it. You wanted a good family, you had it. You wanted a good job, you had it. You wanted job satisfaction, you had it. Now you are in a state of bliss. You have everything you wanted. Everything is perfect. Your house is perfect, your life is perfect, your education is perfect. Everything combined when you sit back in your sofa with a cup of coffee, you feel that feeling that is bliss. It is published, it was published in 1918 in the English Review. It is a, a kind of journal quarterly. So Mansfield is a New Zealand author, she is also a journalist and essays, she wrote many essays. I, I hope that you go and read those essays because they are very thoughtful, very insightful and they will give you an idea of many more aspects of women's writing. Early modernist writing. So when you talk about 1918, that means it is very near to 1920 and we know that the modernism, the movement of modernism started in the early 20th, early 20th century. In during that time, we had writers like T.S. Eliot, we had writers like Virginia Woolf and of course James Joyce uh, from Ireland. Everybody, uh, every people who were writing uh, influential texts were at the peak of modernism. We have discussed this in our previous lectures, just you have to go back and okay, lecture number 7, I have mentioned it there, you can go back and uh, have a look at it. She is a modernist author and the characteristics that have been discussed in her story, the characteristics of her story are given as follows. Mostly what happens in her story is the mind starts negating itself. The mind starts thinking, am I thinking right? Can you think of that? When you think, am I thinking right, you question all the decisions that you have made. You question all the decisions that you have taken. And when you question yourself, you become unsure of what is going to happen. You become unsure of what has happened in your past because everything you have done is your own decision. Oblique narration. I was talking about hints and suggestions right in the starting of this lecture. Oblique narration gives that aspect. Of course, this is a straight line and this line is an oblique. What happens when you are 
writing something in a straightforward manner. You of course think of a situation, you are expressing your love for a loved one. You say I love you, but that is a straightforward way. When you are expressing your uh, affection for somebody else in an oblique narration, you say do you know that uh, you are a very likable person, you have many good qualities, we uh, share much together, uh, would you like to spend some time and figure out what are the common things you are, you are just deflecting, you are taking, you are beating around the bush, you are not coming to the point. So, Oblique narration is that thing, it is just suggesting that something is happening, but it is not putting it into words. Complex characters, this is very, very much the single focal point of modernist writings or writers. All the characters they have come up with are never straightforward, they do not have any idea of what straightforwardness is, they are mostly oblique. Straightforwardness is something which is postmodernist. When you come to postmodern fiction, postmodern po prose, writing, poetry, drama, everything is pinpointed and straightforward. But in modernism, that is previous stage of, uh, of course, the pre previous age, postmodernism is very recent, but modernism, it is oblique it is slanted, it is tilting, it is a hint, a suggestion that you are supposed to derive from, you are supposed to make meaning out of it. The modernist fiction wants you to think, the modernist fiction wants you to connect to the text, connect to the poem, the story by the dint of your own intelligence, by the dint of your own emotions, but postmodernist fiction they say no, 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 you do not have to connect, if you do not want to connect, you do not connect. You will get a lot of examples if you just google postmodernist fictions, you will get it from there. So complex characters, sudden revelations, this is very classic, classic in the sense even the short stories of O. Henry and Oscar Wilde, if you read them, they always had a twist at the end of the story. Everything the story is proceeding in a normal way, okay, this thing is happening, that thing is happening and suddenly there at the end there is a twist. The characters get to know some really uh, sad or happy things that they did not know before. The reader becomes enamored by the entire setup of the story. So sudden revelations are also classic for Catherine Mansfield. Now let us move on to the story Bliss. Let me give you the setting of the story. This particular character, uh, the main protagonist of the uh, story, she is expecting people for dinner at her house. She has this, she has the most perfect life. She has a loving husband, she has a very small and cute baby girl. She loves her very much. What happens then? Let, this is the opening lines of the story. Let us have a small read. Although Bertha Young was 30, she still had moments like this when she wanted to run instead of walk, to take dancing steps on and off the pavement, to bowl a hoop, to throw something up in the air and catch it again, or to stand still and laugh at nothing, at nothing simply. So, the character of Bertha Young, this is the protagonist of the story, she, she was 30, 30 years old, she still had moments like this, whichever the moment it is, when she wanted, see she is not doing those works, she is wanting to do it, this is the first instance of desire that we get in the story. She desires to do these things, but the very first thing that the author has mentioned is that she is 30. That means the society does not expect her to behave in that way. These are the actions she wants to perform, 
but she is not allowed to perform like that she is not allowed to dance on the street she is not allowed to skip or let's say to throw something up and catch in the air that would simply show her childishness people would call it childish childish is not a quality which people think good they think that okay you are an adult now you must behave in an adult way all right moving on to the next part oh there is no way you can express it without being drunk and disorderly so see this sentence there is no way you can express it we will talk about the later section after some time there is no way you can say that to the society no way you can express your feelings no way you can express your desire unless you are drunk and disorderly unless you have drank a lot of alcohol and you are tipsy at that time society will say okay she is drunk she is not in her senses she that behavior is acceptable to society but in normal time if you say that those things to people people are not going to accept that it is a kind of hypocrisy in our society but when you are drunk you can say all those things how idiotic civilization is the entire civilization that we are living in it is quite idiotic why be given a body if you have to keep it shut up in a case like a rare rare fiddle fiddle the word fiddle fiddle is a kind of a musical instrument you play it with your hands it's a stringed instrument it's a very small guitar if i can explain it to you and you just pull the strings and you play on it why be given a body if you have to keep it shut up in a case like a rare rare fiddle if you have a body and you have a society where you can express the needs of the body what is the problem the society is the problem the society will not allow the expression of the body here the author makes or gives a small metaphor to explain why the body is shut in a in a case how the body is shut in a case and nobody can fiddle with the body nobody can touch the body unless and until socially sanctioned this is what she is reminiscing right at the very first part of the story what happens next but in her bosom there are still that bright glowing place although what is happening to her people are coming she is going and getting ready for the dinner she is arranging the plates the salads the carpet the living room the dining room she is arranging all of it like an adult of course but in her bosom there was still that bright glowing place that shower of little sparks coming from it is it really sparks coming out of her bosom no she is feeling happy inside she is having that very warm feeling the feeling of getting something when you desire it and attain it it was almost unbearable so the feeling of happiness the feeling of satisfaction in her was unbearable but we still don't know what she is getting because the desire so far she has mentioned over here and her frustration over here we are still not sure what she is getting because if she is feeling happy or if she is feeling pleasure inside then she must be getting something right she hardly dared to breathe for fear of fanning it higher and yet she breathed deeply deeply she hardly dared to look into the cold mirror but she did look and it gave her back a woman radiant with smiling trembling lips with big dark eyes and an air of listening waiting for something divine to happen that she knew must happen infallibly here we see that she is hoping for something she is longing for something she is expecting something we don't know what what she is expecting we have absolutely no idea 
but whatever it is it is of course related to her sexuality because these are the signs these words are the words over here which add to the idea of her entire body she is actually looking at her body in the mirror she is observing these features of her body she is and uh, she is fully conscious that she is breathing very heavily and all of these signs point towards the fact she is getting in touch with her own bodily feelings she is expecting something she is accepting her uh, desire now let us move on to the next part here everybody the guests have arrived they are speaking to each other now we also know that she has invited somebody called miss falton we don't know who she is and neither did bertha what miss miss falton did bertha didn't know they had met at the club and bertha had fallen in love with her see a straight forward sentence but to the viewers to the readers to the audience this is not the love that it should be everybody has taken or considered it as a love which is akin to friendship because that is socially sanctioned and this is not socially sanctioned as she always did fall in love with beautiful women who had something strange about them when the author writes this particular sentence now the readers are on their guard okay that means bertha is actually a lesbian the readers have derived this from these two sentences as she always did fall in love with beautiful women who had something strange about them so bertha is a person who is drawn towards women she is the one who has invited miss falton to her house today other guests have also been invited and under the pretext of the dinner she has invited miss falton whom she had met at the club but she didn't know what she did what miss falton did she didn't know much about her to getting to know about her is what is giving her so much pleasure and she was about to throw the last one she surprised herself by suddenly hugging it to her passionately passionately but it did not put on the fire in her bosom oh on the contrary this is the scene where she is rearranging the living room the sofa she is picking up the pillows and putting it on the sofa all the time thinking of meeting miss falton and getting to know her when the guests are arriving just before that when she is clearing the living room she is expecting so much that she is hugging the pillow to towards herself with her hands and hugging it very dearly deeply as if she is almost ecstatic see this is the language of desire what the language of desire we otherwise see apparently if it would have been a boy or a man the audience would have accepted it very nicely yes she is very ecstatic but just because it is a thought of a girl we are a little bit passive in this case the audience becomes passive okay i don't understand what is going on but catherine mansfield as an author she has done her job she has made it very evident she has reinforced the passionate structure so much that the audience is bound to give in and listen to the heartbeat of this character the windows of the drawing room opened on to a balcony overlooking the garden at the far end against the wall there was a tall slender pear tree in fullest richest bloom it should it stood perfect i am too happy too happy she murmured so now she is associating her happiness to the pear tree in her garden because the pear tree is covered in fruits it is fertile it has uh, branches and leaves and it is growing now she is thinking i am like the pear tree it has everything it needs i have everything i need 
and she seemed to see on her eyelids the, lo the lovely pear tree with its wide open blossoms as a symbol of her own life. See, that is what I am talking about. She is associating herself with the pear tree. She is associating herself with the pear tree. Really, really, she had everything. Miss Fulton did not look at her, but she seldom did look at people directly. Now, here the dinner is going on and we are getting a direct image of Miss Fulton. Her heavy eyelids lay upon her eyes and the strange half smile came and went upon her lips as though she lived by listening rather than seeing. But Bertha knew suddenly as if the longest most intimate look had passed between them as if they had said to each other, you too? That Pearl Fulton stirring the beautiful red soup in the grey plate was feeling just what she was feeling. In these lines we see that not only is Bertha in love with Pearl Fulton but also she thinks that Pearl Fulton is equally in love with her because these lines clearly indicate her feeling that is Bertha's feeling. We know nothing about Pearl Fulton but Bertha thinks that she is in love with her. Look had passed between them as if they had said to each other you too. Okay, let us see in the story what happens next. I believe this does happen very very rarely between women never between men thought Bertha but while I am making the coffee in the drawing room perhaps she will give me a sign. Now she thinks that they are going to have an intimate moment together. Not only is her hopes high but she also thinks they are going to she is expecting a situation to come up. When she thought like this she saw herself talking and laughing. This is the expression of her pleasure. She had to talk because of her desire to laugh. She wanted to laugh because she is getting what she has wanted. Now what happens is that Bertha's husband returns and Harry is not very kind towards Pearl Fulton. Although Harry is very jovial, very accommodating but for Pearl Fulton he behaves very strangely and Bertha thinks that Harry does not like her. Harry does don't dislike her. She talks to her husband. You are quite wrong about her. She is wonderful, wonderful. And besides, how can you feel so differently about someone who means so much to me? I shall try to tell you when we are in bed tonight what has, ha has been happening, what she and I have shared. This is the world Bertha is living in. Bertha thinks they have shared quite an intimate moment by just you know exchanging looks by just looking into each other's eyes for a split second. At those last words something strange and almost terrifying darted into Bertha's mind and this something blind and smiling whispered to her soon these people will go the house will be quite quiet the lights will be out and you and he will be alone together in the dark room the warm bed. She jumped up from her chair and ran over to the piano. What a pity someone does not play, she cried. What a pity somebody does not play. For the first time in her life, Bertha Young desired her husband. This is a very you know, dramatic moment in the story. Why would Bertha or why would the author say that this is the first time the woman is desiring her husband? Because clearly she has a child. She is uh, in a family. She must be desiring her husband all the time. But this is the first time the woman uh, that is Bertha is desiring her husband. What happened to the rest of their times? He, did she des not desire her husband before this? So at this point of time she is clearly thinking about having a sexual relationship with the woman which is creating an ecstatic moment in her and she knew that although Pearl Fulton will go away, she will remain with her husband. So this is not love, this is lust. 
this is not love for her husband rather this is the lust that she has developed in herself and she is going to take it out on her husband after the evening is has ended now the guests are going home miss falton moved towards the hallway and barsa was following when harry almost pushed past let me help you barsa knew that he was repenting for his rudeness she let him go so now pearl falton is going towards the gate she is going to leave and harry on the other hand has just rushed to help pearl falton barsa thinks that Harry is just being kind because he knows that he has been rude before. Now this is the turning point of the story. While she looked it up, she turned her head towards the hall and she saw Harry with Miss Fulton's coat in his arms and Miss Fulton with her back turned to him and her head bent. He tossed the coat away, put his hands on her shoulders and turned her violently to him. his lips said i adore you and miss fulton laid her moonbeam fingers on his cheeks and smiled her sleepy smile harry's nostrils quivered his lips curled back in a hideous green while he whispered tomorrow and with her eyelids miss fulton said yes so this is the scene where the story nearly ends here the audience gets to know that actually harry is having an affair with pearl fulton and pearl fulton is the person bertha had met in the club because pearl fulton wanted to be invited to harry's house and this is all a planned thing because bertha is attracted towards this woman has nothing to do with this woman that is pearl fulton to come to harry's house she had no feelings for bertha all she had was feelings for harry and the entire evening is something which is frustrating now for bertha because bertha was only seeing what she wanted to see in pearl fulton bertha uh, pearl fulton's entire image was only a mirror in which bertha's own emotions were getting reflected she thought that bertha liked her but bertha is already having an affair with her husband so there is no point in that so here the story ends and that is the moment of truth for the audience although the desire is there the frustration creeps in with the expectations even the pear tree which was a symbol of bartha's life which had everything the fruits the branches the um, uh, entire setup it was perfect it was like bartha's life and now even the pear tree is there it cannot do anything if somebody comes and cut it off all right desire in women's writing if you just have a look at the poems by kamala das amrita pritam Elizabeth Barrett Browning short stories by Ismat Chuktai Krishna Sovti Virginia Woolf they all talk about their sexualities characters sexualities authors sexualities what they desire how they desire and whom they desire their works are full of these things but before this there was no such expression of desire only in uh, the writings of virginia wolf you will get a clear cut idea of lesbianism and how a woman desires a woman all of those things apart from that i'm talking you read this especially kamala das she is a confessional poet she confesses about her own self amrita pritam you will see she is writing in punjabi and hindi and her writings are full of the desire of the a uh, female heart desire of the human body desire of the human mind and these are more passionate very much very much akin to the love like relationships you have elizabeth barrett browning is full of adoration for uh, robert browning 
she desires more company with robert browning and all of these things you will get to know ismat shuktai of course lihaf you must read the short story lihaf krishna sovthi and virginia wolf all right these are a list of references that you can go through there is much more you just type the name of these authors and you will get to know a lot of things about these authors and their works which clearly point towards the fact that desire in a human being is something which is very instinctive very impulsive very basic if you try to suppress it that human being is going to suffer from depression that human being is going to have problems relating to life outside and around him or her so all of these we should first try to bring into discussion that is in day to day life discussion and with these words i end this lecture over here just to mention that if you are reading further text you must keep in mind to read between the lines and identify the desirable objects therefore you will also be able to connect to the characters of the um literature pieces that you are reading all right thank you very much for being with us today here see you in the next lecture understanding oneself understanding others understanding society at large understanding the nature these are all driven by basic human curiosity we would all love to understand why things happen what happens what is the final outcome why certain things fail these are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge therefore knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts they have to be rooted into historical perspective they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio political reasons behind this whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences whether you talk with respect to physical sciences biological sciences social sciences that's the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us the knowledge that is actual reality how do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality with the social reality with the socio political compulsions okay how do you understand the law of nature okay in its totality and for doing that you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences say for instance if you human being you start looking at it from a pure biological point of view if you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength say for example you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life you are looking at things from a physical point of view you are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body you are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information you are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process why still human beings engage into it you are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view why society at large admire things which has full of risk you are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences you are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view so there are whole lot of things and then finally you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life then you say you are looking at life you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view and this is what 
social sciences courses provide you. They provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be social sciences stuff, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the knowledge is what humanities social science courses help you obtain.